Welcome Spartans to Podcast Evolved, your favorite Halo podcast. I'm your host today, David, and with me today, we have a very special episode for you. Um, so joining me is Oren. Hey, everybody. Krista. Hello. Aaron. Hi, guys. And our super special guest, we're delighted to announce, Tobias Buckel, author of The Cold Protocol, Oasis and Envoy. Say hello, Tobias. Hi, hi. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Excellent stuff. So Tobias, today we're just going to grill you on literally anything and everything we can think about. <laughs> um, so first of all, we're all massive great team fans, so we're absolutely in love with you for that. So thank you for creating one of our favorite teams in the Halo universe. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. It's It's been a lot of fun to be able to bring them to life and uh, get to play with them over the two books. Play, did you hear that? You just announced Halo 6, great team. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks oh, very yeah, much, Tobias. There we go. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> gotcha. It's exactly what I wanted. So, Tobias, we're going to pretty much, you can tell us all about yourself. So, um, well, a little bit about yourself. So, you are an author, sir. Yes, yes. I, you know, I've been lucky enough to make most of my living as an author since 2006. So, still kind of uh, living the freelance lifestyle and loving it. <laughs> freelance life that sounds awesome i'm gonna get me one of those i you know i tend to be a night owl so it, it really lines up well for me that's funny i think a lot of authors that uh, i've seen always write about that they're insomnia keeping them up so they just write instead yeah yeah no i've i've been the guy that uh stays up late in college and works on projects and kind of keeps to myself and and you know just i find after midnight to be a super creative time for myself that's pretty cool I like to think of myself that too, but instead of creating, I just play other people's creations into the wee hours of the night. I think we all do oh, the same. I'm not saying that I don't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's kind of how I got roped into this whole Halo gig. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Um, um, since 2006, you've been able to support yourself. So I know, looking at your back catalog and stuff like that, that you've been writing since 2000, am I right? So yeah. you have quite, let's say, since you started working yourself up to where you can support yourself. What, what was that like? You know, uh, science fiction, you know, as a genre has this incredible short story market. So in, in uh, the early days, I was just trying to get short stories published so that I could get better as a writer and get my name out there and make a little bit of money at, at the writing. So I started publishing in science fiction magazines and anthologies uh, starting in about 1999 and kind of moved my way up through the field a bit there uh, in 2004. Five years in, I kind of met my agent, got agented, and he had me write my first novel, which was Crystal Rain, which came out in 2006. And since 2006, I've been a full-time freelancer because I uh, was laid off from my job and decided to kind of just take a jump and take a stab at trying to live this this life. Oh, congratulations. It seems to have uh, it worked out well, I, I thought, I'm assuming. Some, some years it works out well, some years it works out less <laughs> well, and some years it works out really well. So the trick is always just trying to smooth out the, 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 the variations. Of that. Well, congratulations. <laughs> I think you're doing yeah. a great job. Oh, thank you. I think there's a theme of uh, the Halo novelists and authors that they get in. It seems to be already established, well, kind of science fiction writers. So I... Personally, haven't read any of your works other than the Halo franchise. Um, I've seen that you have quite a back catalog there of a lot of short novels and a lot of um, a lot of your own novels and your own series. Um, so I think that seems to be going well for you. You have a new release coming out soon. Am I right? Yeah, uh, the Tangled Lands just came out. It's a fantasy novel told in four parts by me and uh, Paolo Bacigalupi, and it's uh, sort of fantasy, you know, and. Uh, about what happens when you know the the price of magic is kind of ignored by the populace, kind of a tragedy of the commons, oh, and wow. yeah, so that I think is my tenth or eleventh novel uh, or book. I, I don't know if we can call this a novel since some people balk at that since it's four stories that make a novel, but it is a book for sure. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, it's you know when I when I did the first Halo novel. That was my third book. So I was relatively early on in my career there. Other other authors seem to have come in much later uh, in their career, but I was lucky enough to get asked to do it on my after I'd written my third novel. Excellent. That's a lovely segue into what I want to ask you about. So in terms of how you went from your, as you said, you were brand new 
and you went straight in. So I imagine you knew what the Halo universe was. Are you a gamer? Have you played the games? Yeah, I played a ton of Halo 3 in particular. I'd uh, switched to an Xbox because a good friend of mine who I knew at college told me that the uh, co-op play in Halo 3 was really, really good and the online play was really good. And he wanted a way to be able to keep in touch and play uh, video games while chatting. So that kind of like, you know, we didn't just want to call each other and talk because, I don't know, <laughs> that something who, there. Who does that you know, anymore? Yeah, who does that, right? You know, it's, uh, I would say a millennial, but I'm right on the, the cusp of millennial versus Gen X, I guess, since I was born in 79. <laughs> but for, for us, it was just kind of like, you know, what's something that has a great, you know, place that we can chat while also doing something else and for us that ended up being halo 3 we played a ton of halo 3 together um, as well as left for dead left for dead 2 and um, particularly crackdown as well we really liked co-op oh, yeah. and crackdown but halo 3 was the one that kind of got us sucked in in fact my wife used to call it the other woman and <laughs> we played a ton of halo 3 and that kind of you know gave me a pretty good familiarity with the game so that like when you know Bungie kind of had me in for the interview to ask me questions you know they started explaining to me what Halo was about and I kind of jumped in with actually I have really specific questions <laughs> oh excellent I'm sure that went down really well how did you mean yeah that, that's the process so it was an interview based thing uh, for the first book, yeah, my editor at Tor Books, which had the contract at the time to do Halo novels, and I flew out to Bungie in Seattle and, you know, kind of had some basic rough ideas of things that we could maybe pitch. But it was very much a kind of, you know, thing where I kind of got vetted, you know, uh, they'd read one of my novels originally. So, you know, they they'd gotten a bunch of books from my editor that of, of writers that could conceivably write a Halo novel. And mine was one of the books where they kind of, you know, a number of people responded positively to, you know, reading them and said, hey, this guy seems to be doing some really interesting things. Maybe he could write a Halo novel. So that's how I kind of snuck in as a younger writer who got to to jump on it. Um, my editor knew I was a Halo fan. So that's one of the reasons he tossed my book in the pile because, you know, he and I had talked about playing it before. And when we flew out then, you know, it was a case of like, instead of them having to sort of see if I could fit into the universe, it was a case of them learning that I actually was pretty familiar with it. I'd played Halo 3 really extensively. I'd done some playthroughs of 1 and 2 very quickly. Um, and at that time, that pretty much was everything. So, you know, there wasn't, uh, there weren't that many books. Uh, there were only a handful of comics. And then there was the I Love Bees campaign made up like the bulk of the lore. So I was pretty familiar with everything. And if, uh, I knew a lot about the I Love Bees campaign just because of the um, uh, all the articles about uh, alternative reality gaming that, that, that people were talking about. So the I Love Bees campaign was so unique at the time. It was so new that uh, I was familiar with it just from reading about it, even though I hadn't participated. The I Love Bees, I think it was these guys here who actually informed me about it. I missed that completely when it happened at the time. And it was only, I think, Krista and Aaron. I think you guys were all over this before I was. Yeah, no. I came to it late as well. Because it, it was the same thing. Like, I played the first two Halo games late in the run up to three and i think there were only like four or five books out at that stage it was an easier time to keep track of lore that's for sure <laughs> oh there's so many books now <laughs> there's a crazy amount so did you come up with the concept of gray team or was that something that bungie kind of pitched to you that was uh something that bungie kind of pitched to me and that they were like here's this thing that we have gray team um, and since I had read uh, Nyland's books in preparation for going out to the meeting, I knew exactly what they were talking about. So when they said, you know, is there anything you can do with Gray Team, you know, based on the ideas that I came to the meeting with, plus what they were talking about, I, I immediately had, you know, a basic rough idea for, for the cold protocol, which was like, how about we take Gray Team and we have them wander into this kind of situation, which is the situation that I set up in the book. And they were positive. So they asked me to head back and work on an outline based on what I just kind of given them a sentence or two about. So yeah, that was a very successful meeting with them. So I'm curious, when you present them that sort of outline, how much back and forth with Bungie is there or at the time with Bungie on like the outline of that story? Like, do they give you a lot of freedom to direct it or did they give you like a start and end point or anything? 
um, at the time, they gave me a tremendous amount of freedom. Uh, one of the reasons it, it was fun to work with them and why I came back for a second book was uh, they were very flexible. So it was a, a great collaboration, uh, you know, in terms of my coming to the table and saying, here are the things I'm interested in doing. You know, how do, you know, we're just trying to figure out how we meet each other's needs. I have some artistic needs. There are some things I wanted to write about. There are some corners of the Halo universe I really wanted to explore that I felt were kind of left unexamined. And there were some areas that they needed filled because they're like, we want you know to see certain things happen here in the universe. We want to explore these corners. So we want to give the fans this. And so you kind of look at that list and you go, okay, so how do we do, you know, how do we fill, how do we fulfill both of our, both of our kind of objectives here? And then you kind of like have to have to thread that needle. Um, but it was very collaborative. It wasn't like I got marching orders that said, you have to do this and then end up here. Um, and this is what it's going to look like. And then you can have some fun if you play, you know, color in between the lines. That would have been very unfulfilling for me um, because as as awesome as it was to to write a Halo novel and, and have the sales of a Halo novel, ultimately, I don't get paid enough as a writer to to sort of completely sell myself out, even though I'm sure some people <laughs> kind of looked at me as writing a Halo novel and went like, ah, he sold out. Um, I honestly oh, did man. it because I played a ton of Halo 3 and I came at it as like, you know, one of those things where you go like, hey, I'm a fan of this thing. And the people who make it approached me and said, would you like to play in our sandbox? And I said like, yeah, that sounds like fun. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it wasn't so much about the money as a combination of, I mean, honestly, it was more money than I usually make for a, a, a book of my own, but it was a combination of like a little extra money and, you know, having a, a year a year of fun. So with the outline, they were very flexible because they communicated what they wanted very early on. Um, and I basically gave them, uh, a rough outline. The, 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 the complicated thing about it was, um, and this is, this is, I'm not denigrating anyone. I'm just, this is a different workflow because they're a gaming company and they have a lot of specifics. Whenever I'd send in an outline, they would have a lot of questions, you know? So as a writer, you used to saying like, you know, oh, uh, and, and, and then this will happen. And it's a very vague summary, you know, because you're like, I don't know how that's going to happen until I sit down and write it. And, you know, they always wanted specifics. So one of the funny things about the outline was just that as it kept going back and forth, it became so detailed and so large that at some point I kind of sent back an email that was like, Hey guys, at, at this point, I'm basically writing a book, you know, like <laughs> let's, let's just give me a couple months and, and let me flesh out an outline or a, you know, a rough first draft. And then you can take a look at it and, and any of the specifics that are problematic, I'll fix in revision, you know, because we'd started out with a, you know, 3000 word outline and then it became a 6,000 word outline and then it became a 12,000 word outline. And I think somewhere <laughs> around 15 to 16,000 words, I kind of went, you know, Hey, this is, this is actually a short novel right now. So let's, let's just go ahead and let me, you know, turn me loose, so to speak. Um, and that was the first time that had ever happened with me. So that, that, that was, that was new to me, but it wasn't because they were giving me marching orders or it was unpleasant. It's just a different, it was a different workflow because they had lots and lots of questions and artists are squirrely people. I believe so. And I imagine it was, were you given, not to say like a Bible, but a list of, here's a list of weapons, a list of vehicles, a list of Oh man, I did I did entirely have a bible. I had to sign it out in blood of my firstborn. Um <laughs> I I had to sign legal documents that promised a plague of horrors upon me and my family for many generations. The blood. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh if if it was ever if it ever left my my presence so uh yeah i had did I had you just a Bible. chain it to your um did you just chain it to your hand it was just always there you know it's the sort around. of thing where you felt like you had to walk around with a, a briefcase chained to your wrist uh you know to keep hold of it uh yeah they, they were at that time that the bible was extremely confidential information and i had to very much you know uh be aware of the fact that i couldn't say anything about anything that was in it and that was that was kind of interesting because you you know at the time I got to see all kinds of things that you know were were not known to the general halo public and my 
utter fear, of course, is that I have the worst memory. I just have the worst memory. I'm such a complete <laughs> and utter scatterbrain, which will prove problematic for you later in this interview when you ask me very specific questions. But I'm a oh, complete God, no. <laughs> sieve, right? And so my greatest fear was that I would say something somewhere that was not supposed to be open knowledge that I had assumed was open knowledge just because after playing all the games, reading all the books, reading the comics and getting all prepped for this, they then gave me the Bible. I read the whole Bible and then I was like, crap, <laughs> because it was just all kind of one big thing in the back of my head. It was just sort of like, I, I don't think I can talk about Halo at all anymore to anyone. Yeah. Was it hard <laughs> to talk to fans of the novels and stuff like that after it released because you had this wealth of knowledge? I, I just I had to sort of red flag certain things to just be like, don't ever talk about that or be as vague as possible. And sometimes it was really frustrating because fans would get upset about something that I had put in there that I hadn't put in there, um, but that Bungie had asked me to put in there. They'd say like, oh, well, this couldn't be because, you know, it's generally accepted that blah, blah, blah. And this novel kind of, you know, changes that. And I, I just have to be like, well, you know, in the back of my head, it's in the Bible. Um, <laughs> but you can't kind of come back with that, you know, you can't, you can't argue, you can't, you know, it's not your place to argue. You just kind of nod and take it. Um, and so, yeah, there are a lot of specific things where, you know, there'd be, you know, I think there was a huge discussion about the nature of the armor that was on the cover design. And oh God, I'm sure I, it was. <laughs> I, I was like, you know, sounds like a Halo. uh, there was there was a lot of there's a lot of back and forth on that and people would constantly email me and I was always just sort of like I'm really sorry I can't act I you know this is what they this is what they chose um, and they had really good reasons for choosing it and um, they kind of get to decide don't they this wasn't like the author yeah. the author doesn't get to decide what's on the cover the author wasn't like hey they're gonna use this type of armor and screw you fans it was just sort of like you know they were like here this is the kind of armor it's gonna be awesome you're gonna love it you know and i'm like yeah um and then all of a sudden why is everyone mad um <laughs> <laughs> so did bungie or microsoft did anyone like prep you beforehand in terms of where you're now like an author now for halo canon the floodgates will open for emails and all sorts of craziness <laughs> coming at you directly uh, i imagine that's i was not before. prepped <laughs> I was not prepped. I was not prepped. But most people have actually been really nice, um, particularly particularly in person. Everyone has been super nice. You know, I understand that a lot of the questions come out of curiosity and attachment and fandom. It's not meant to be hostile to me, most of it, most of it. Um, and so it just comes from a place of wanting to know. Um, and I understand that it can be frustrating when I kind of throw up my hands and say, like, eh, it wasn't my decision or I, you know, I don't. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and I certainly don't ever want to be like, you know, you know, the Shatner SNL skit where I'm like, go home. Don't you have lives? Um, yeah. That's not that's not the place I come from either. I really enjoy playing it. Uh, I don't know the fandom or the, the lore as deep as some of the fans do, um, even though I've been exposed to many different Bibles and I've, I've read through a ton of it. Um, but I uh, come from it from a place of love as well and enjoying playing it. So I understand when, why people are passionate about it. So it, it, it basically just rolls off. You know, I've never really been super upset about it. Good. I'm glad your experience with the Halo community has been positive because I know it can also be passionate and that can go either way depending on the yeah. situation it, you're it talking can to. go either way but most people you know i don't i don't assume malice unless people kind of double down and continue to be a problem in which case i've got really great block features on email and really great block <laughs> features on twitter and uh they just cease to exist as far as i'm concerned and fortunately i have a very strong um you know, I have a little bit of that. Actually, what I have is the, what, what do you call the um, oppositional defiance? So when people start getting really squirrely with me, I kind of, I kind of, you know, it doesn't have the same effect that it has on other people for me. So I'm, I'm very lucky in that regard. Well, that's a great way to be. Um, so just on the process of, of writing and stuff like that, were there any major differences between, say, like, okay, I know it's been like eight years, I think, between um, Pearl Call to Call and Oasis? Um, was there major differences between, say, working with Bungie and working with 343i? So it was really interesting. When I was writing Halo the Cold Protocol, uh, that was the time when actually 
343 was being created because uh, when I started the book, it was Bungie. Then Microsoft acquired Bungie and then they were combined. And then the process of the kind of divorce was happening. And then 343 was kind of being created, uh, which actually made it a kind of mysterious process for me because I at, at some point during that process, I was never really sure who was in charge of me. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, you kind of didn't know where to send requests. I remember anecdotally to this day, I remember at some point because they it, this wasn't their fault. I mean, they were very busy trying to create three, 343. So they were super busy. And there was this this month where I kind of wasn't able to talk to anyone. And I was in the middle of writing the book. And even though I'd gotten approved <laughs> on the outline, there were a couple things I wanted to do as I started to write the book. I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we did you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I remember I went to San Diego Comic-Con and I was there on a panel with one of the people who could approve, uh, you know, an up or down decision. (laughs) Um, And I remember pulling him aside right before the panel and saying, hey, this is a weird question, but can I destroy planet? Blah, blah, blah. I forget what what it was, but I'm like, "Can can I have it blown up? You know, can I glass this place? And they looked at me for a second and were like, yeah, do it. And I was like, great. (laughs) So... (laughs) You know, it's one of those. And then we like jumped on this panel and had like a thousand Halo fans or more. I forget how much it was, but it was a lot of people and kind of answered questions about the book that was about to come out at some point and the next game. But yeah, it was one of those things where I was like, I, I don't know who, I don't know. I don't, you know, the emails have changed, you know, everyone's sorting things out. I'm sure it'll all get sorted out in a few weeks, but I'm right now deep in the middle of this draft and I need an answer like now. Um, so yeah, during the first game, uh, during the first book, it was really interesting in that they were going through that process. And then by the revisions to the book, they'd sorted it out and everything was fine. Um, when I wrote Halo Envoy, it was just dealing with 343 and there was a great team, a great team that was, uh, associated with that. So I knew exactly who to call and who to talk to, um, for all the details. And for me, it was really great. I was really grateful for that because they were great about, um, they're really specific details, like what kind of guns someone would have. Um, they went through and looked at it for all those really small things that I may have missed, you know, just by just tripping over myself or mind being a sieve. So they had like a guy who was just a weapons expert who went through it and read it all just for that and would send back notes like, oh, we need to change this gun to this kind of gun and you need to use this. And then they had like a lot of kind of like, hey, we want you to put this kind of vehicle in there and this kind of vehicle in there. Can you swap out this vehicle for that vehicle? So like they they were down there on that linear level just going like, here's the loadout. And that was great because then I could actually kind of relax and be like, okay, well, they're they're pouring over it very carefully for this kind of stuff. And I don't have to then cross check on that level every little detail and second guess myself and worry about someone kind of you know, flaming me on the internet later because I used the wrong kind of, uh, you know, SMG. (laughs) That weapon didn't exist then. Oh my God. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. that that happens. So, and, and you feel really bad if you screw that up because sometimes, you know, sometimes people will notice a mistake like that and you kind of go like, oh no, they're right. (laughs) (laughs) What have I done? You know, or, or, or you spawn an entire like thread of people trying to figure out how a gun like that ended up early in the process of the universe. So they're like, you know, maybe it could have been like a prototype and it ended up here for this reason. And you're like, no, 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 no. actually I can't say this out loud, but it was the author's dumb fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're great at that now. I'm, I'm sure like the, like I, that's fascinating to know that it was that early process that was happening. That seemed because those are the things we don't see um, from, we don't see behind the curtain. I don't think we really need to either, but uh, I find that's fascinating. They were great at like, you know, other things too, just, you know, coming back to me on details about the plot and, and bigger stuff. But yeah, it was really, it was really relieving to know that they would, they would catch those kind of details as that's the sort of stuff that keeps me up at night. Cause I know, I know there'll be a mistake <laughs> like that somewhere in the manuscript. If I do it alone, you could just write man shoot gun and just let them fill in the blanks. Yeah, of what what? <laughs> <laughs> Drives vehicle A and just wait for someone else to check it, but. That's great. That that is an interesting point about the um about the vehicles and I guess in general just all the other kind of arsenal that is in the Halo universe because we were we were discussing on um on our kind of review and impressions of Envoy on a previous episode and we were talking on how in Envoy there's there's like a whole lineup of different vehicles in it like the array of peppering in this aircraft versus this uh, land vehicle to kind of help. I guess uh, flesh out the universe, and a lot of and some of these vehicles are, are new or 
primarily featured in one of the more recent games. And I think we, we just kind of made a comment about that on how it kind of just helped fleshes out the, the world that we see these different vehicles in action because there's different purposes with all these abilities and all that. And so I think that's, that's great that you guys are able to collaborate in that regard to, to, to allow all these, you know, use the huge sandbox that Halo has. Yeah, and it shows you how 343 is really committed to keeping track of all the little details of the universe, you know, in a way that doesn't burden, like, you know, someone coming up with the, you know, the actual novel. Um, they, you know, came back, a lot of those new vehicles, they kind of came back with me, you know, came back to me with and said, hey, is there, you know, can you fit one of these in? Can you swap out this for this? And you know, here's some details about it, you know, and how it works. Um, and, you know, we think fans would really like this. And, I was, yeah, I was always delighted to do that because anything, anything that like gives the fans an extra thrill, like, oh, here's something brand new that you are just now seeing in a game and it's coming out in a book at the same time, I think is kind of cool. I don't, you know, to me at least. Uh, oh yeah. That's, that's the kind of stuff that we live for. It very much, uh, <laughs> very much is the only, the reason we're here. So it's great to see like Orange is that seeing certain vehicles or weapons in your book really connects it to where that weapon is in a game or where that vehicle shows up in another game. You think, oh, this book is related to that in some tangential way. Um, but that is great to see. It's awesome that the team is, is doing that because we know they're doing that because everything's there for us. Um, so we touched on a point there. It was Cold Protocol and then Envoy. But in the middle there, you had a short story, which is ties in, uh, Oasis ties in directly to um, to Envoy. So how did that process happen in terms of the quite a large time gap, I want to say, eight years between um, Cold Protocol and Oasis. And was it a talk about Oasis and Envoy? Were, they, were those two projects one at once in, in one stage? Uh, they weren't one, but it was clear that when they were doing the anthology that would come out a year before the book Envoy, that they wanted to have a story by me in the anthology because I'd had a story called Dirt in the uh, previous, uh, I think, Evolutions anthology. And oh, how did I miss that? Yes, you're they right. were they were asking like, you know, can we do a repeat? You know, get another story from you as as well. And they wanted to see if I could tie it in to the to the upcoming book. You know, to be like a teaser. And I had originally kind of come up with an idea that was more tightly coupled with the novel that would work as a teaser. But as I started like looking around for something that worked as a short story that would be satisfying for a reader to read alone, um, I came up with the story Oasis. The, the I kind of, uh, you know, encounter between, a, you know, Sanghealy and uh, a, a young human girl that is just uh, kind of changes their their, the directions of their lives and kind of gives you a taste of what the world is like and what the problems are leading up to the book are like, but gives you a complete story in and of itself so that if that's all you read, you'd still be really satisfied. Um, and yeah, I, I think I worked on that for like a month and, and was able to get that into the anthology just in time. So that was pretty cool. And I, I really, I, that story came out a lot better than it had any right to. I, I kind of like it. <laughs> You kind of like it, but I hope you do because we kind of yeah. like it too. Yeah, no, it 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 really just sang, you know. And sometimes, sometimes you you get all the right notes together, and it it just is uh, it rises above itself. And I was I was really proud of that because both it and dirt, um, you know, I still get I still get uh, fan mail about dirt, you know, ten years later, which is just nuts. That is crazy, and I don't know why that escaped my mind. So in dirt, you wrote the story of the rookie essentially yeah. the odst rookie <laughs> from the game so how did that happen i mean that's awesome i mean i totally for i mean I that's another reading story that, that story. just kind of escaped you know it was supposed to be a short story so like you know three four thousand words and i think it's actually a novelette maybe a novella it's really flipping long um <laughs> so the idea uh for me was i i wanted to write I wanted to kind of like do a backstory for the rookie because he's like nameless and backstoryless in, in the video game. And I wanted to write a kind of, I was just thinking about like all the Halo lore I'd, I'd, I'd accumulated and how to distend, like just sort of compress that into like one little nugget of welcome to the universe. You know, maybe I was thinking at the time, maybe it could be the first story in the anthology or something like that. And as I was putting that together, I 
came up with the, uh, I don't know if you've ever, this is really old, but they're these old videos called Why We Fight. They're black and white World War II uh, U.S. propaganda videos that were shown to U.S. recruits when they're going to boot camp for World War II. And they kind of, you know, give a summary of how everything got to the point of the war and why everyone's going to get involved and fight. And as I was putting that story together, I started off with the heist initially, but as I started to do the back history of the characters, I realized I could kind of just do this real tour through all of the kind of halo lore that we'd had up to that point and what all was happening in the universe and put together the story that kind of like just kind of recapped everything, but in an interesting way that kind of just showed all the stakes for uh, why the, you know, why the things were happening the way they were from the human's perspective. And I just ended up having a lot of fun writing that story with the, the frames, the framing of the heist and it being the rookie and how his team came together over all those years and experienced all these different facets of the, of the war. And I just really love it. It, it just, it, it's really cool. And, and one of the cooler things was a fan group got together and they filmed like two or three episodes of trying to make a, a dirt movie. Um, yeah, so they call it a Halo Hell Jumper. I think I remember. Halo Hell Jumper is what it's called. Yeah. So they, they. So actually, I wrote it, and and I can see like the first two episodes of it online, and they did a really good job. It's it's really wild. I can't believe that this this is a thing that exists. Awesome story. Um, I remember reading dirt. It really stuck out in my mind when the moment the realization that this is the Rocky, that this is the backstory, <laughs> this is who he is. I remember just that just clicking in my brain of like, oh my god, and then like every other great halo story it makes the games better knowing that you're playing sitting down to play that game again having more context than you did before i think we've talked in our podcast before like reading the greg bear trilogy of forerunner books makes halo 4 make way more sense mm-hmm. <laughs> you know I mean? you can understand some of the story and dirt is a great place for that as well um i think it has like this kind of like tree kings kind of vibe i think i've read that somewhere there. it has like it's like soldiers that are kind of robbing yeah. and stealing and yeah. going this heist and it's, it's cool like that it's a very cool story are you mad at matt forbeck for just instantly <laughs> destroying the rookie in, in new blood no i'm not <laughs> uh, matt's too much of a nice guy for me to ever be mad at him no matter what he does <laughs> really because that uh, we did a podcast with matt and we got mad with him for getting the rookie so <laughs> oh. we're like it's just the second page he's dead why would you do this oh that's great i bet you he was laughing the whole time he did that he Absolutely, was he thought we were very funny because he's yeah. just like it's just a rookie, it's fine, and I was like, no man, <laughs> no, <laughs> the rookie. State the, the the time jump, let's say, in terms of where Cold Protocol was and then where Oasis and Envoy takes place. Um, that's a very different universe. What was that like coming back to that where like so many things have happened? I mean, was there like a were you brought up were you up to speed by then? I imagine you must have been, but the Bible whatever they were giving you to prep for Envoy must have been way different than what you were given to prep for um cold protocol yeah so when i wrote the cold protocol I, even during the time i wrote it i wrote a prequel you know it was set back in time so all the universe and lore that i had to de- deal with was frozen which meant that as i was working on it I, there weren't going to be any surprises to me and with this book you know 343 really wanted something current so that you know, people in between games would have something to sort of satisfy themselves with in terms of experiencing the story moving forward um, rather than another kind of snippet of the universe they hadn't seen. So, they, you know, the, the, the request was for the time to be where it was, basically. And so that was risky. Um in terms of having to 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 really make sure I caught up on all the lore, they had kind of um, a new Bible, and it is way bigger than the first one I had. Um, so <laughs> that 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 was you know that was scary. Um, I, I I you know had to go back and refresh my memory with everything, but I came off of just finishing another novel right before we're having to work on this one and. The time, you know, the deadlines were all very tight, so I didn't have as much time to reimmerse myself in everything in the, in the lore. So it, it it definitely felt like a tightrope performance. But you know, fortunately, um, you know, the people at three four three were really great. Uh, Jeremy Patnade, Patnade, 
uh, was one of the guys who works there at 343 who was attached to this project. He was really great at helping me out with lore. Uh, and Tiffany O'Brien as well was there at uh, 343 who just both of them were really on point in terms of being able to answer any questions I had really quickly. So anytime I, I kind of was struggling with something, I would send out an email and I would say probably before the day was out, which is incredible considering that they're on West Coast time. Um, and I'm on East Coast. So before the day was even out, they would usually have a reply back to me about my question for the for the background and lore. So I had this great support team with Jeremy and Tiffany that actually made that side of things really easy. I was not worried about screwing up on the lore thanks to them. And at some point, halfway through writing this book, actually, um, when I was in revisions, the the dates uh, kind of shifted some of the, the structure and ideas that that they had in terms of where I could play in terms of the fictional dates of the universe shifted a bit. So, you know, they immediately kind of worked on some solutions in the edits that, that would fix that. So it was definitely a case of they were there for me and, and that made it really easy. If I had tried to do this all on my own in that short of a time, it would have been very challenging and I probably would have screwed something up. Well, you didn't, and thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quick question. How, how big yeah. is, is, I guess, the 343 team that you that you work with? Um, you kind of mentioned two names already. I imagine you talk with Frankie and just kind of the other more public figures, but... This time around, I didn't talk to Frankie a lot. He's... the the For, for Cold Protocol, I did. And uh, for this, I think they had a team in place that, that knew everything, you know, kind of forwards and backwards. You know, like I mentioned, Jeremy and Tiffany, so they were fantastic. And they also had another gentleman whose name escapes me right now, so I apologize if they're listening, um, who is the weapons expert. Um, so I think like three or four people on the, on the 343 Industries team were tied, you know, to making sure I, I kind of nailed the landing. Um, with Tiffany and Jeremy being kind of point, they were always available by email or phone to make sure that anything I needed, they would have a, a response for me. And so that was great because I felt like I completely had a safety net underneath me at any point in terms of the the lore and the world building and 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 the game. So I, I, I did not at any point feel like I was I was, you know, out in the dark there at all. When you were doing writing this story, it's very much from the great team perspective, it's very much not like the next day, but very soon after the yeah. ending of Cold Protocol because that was an awesome kind of um, way of reintroducing these characters to a world that was new to them and that was maybe new to you as well at the time. So yeah, they, were, yeah. they must have came across as an easier way to kind of, while well, they're asking questions, are able to answer them for them in terms of like, they don't know where they are. They don't know the alliances or who works with who now. I mean, totally. That came across very, uh, quite well. Thank and you. I Thank you very much. Did love the... Um, at the end of a uh, call protocol, let's say great team go away on a mysterious mission. And then <laughs> that's literally it for years upon years upon years. And we're still waiting to know what happened. And then we get this book, which beautifully introduced, like we said, we recently did a, our podcast on Envoy and we all commented on how awesome it was. You kind of drip thread the information throughout the book of what happened. And it was from the get go. It's very ominous of what they were. I mean, we'll talk specifics into the book later on, but um, sure, I love that. I loved that that's how that happened and and how that worked. Um, so, also touching on that, I think, Aaron, is this your question specifically about the Jirahani? And I think this is my question. No. Oh, is it Aaron? But, Do you want to go ahead? I mean, yeah, well, yeah, it's just, um, so I'm, I guess, relative to David and Aaron and I think even to Krista, I, I've read, I think, the least of the Halo novels. And so I'm kind of catching up um, with everybody. And, and this book, Envoy, um, really took me a little by surprise that it it felt just more for lack of a better word brutal and just kind of the the way you described kind of the action on, on the the Jirohane and the Sanghili um, when they fight and kind of how they you know they, they fight and murder humans and it just seemed like a little bit more intense and and a little more visual with the with the storytelling and so I was just curious if that was just kind of an extension of your writing and some and some of your other works, or uh, is that maybe a three four three point? And then if there was ever, did you ever go too far, maybe in, in kind of the writing on and the descriptions that we kind of had to tone it down for the, the the younger audience, so to speak. You know, I'm 
you know, I live in the U.S. right now, and, and one of the things that's really interesting is that whenever I am at a book fair or something like that, you know, you always have a parent with a 12-year-old in tow or something like <laughs> that, and they, they walk up to you and they're like, is this book appropriate for my kid? Which for me is just the, the lo- ultimate loaded question because I'm like, I don't know how you parent. I don't know the maturity of your kid. I don't know how well read they are. I don't know how well they take different things so that I don't, I can't look at some random 12 year old and be like, yeah, sure. He should read this or, you know, yeah, sure. She, she, she should read this. It's so hard. You know, it's so hard to say. Um, and, 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 you know, we're, we're all aware that a lot of younger folk read these books. So, so there is that, I think in the U S in particular, what I found is having conversations with most of these adults is they're perfectly happy for any amount of gore. They just don't want any sex in there. Um, (laughs) so I can get away with just about anything I want in terms of like, you know, people ripping living hearts out of still, you know, live living human bodies. And that's okay. Just as long as no one smooches, uh, most parents are going (laughs) to let it slide. So I I actually think it's kind of a double standard actually as a, as a society, but, uh, I do tend to really love writing really kind of visceral action, you know, so I'm, I'm part of the problem. Um, <laughs> oh no, I think, and, I think it's great. Uh, uh, oh I no, mean, yeah, it, yeah these, that these, definitely these comes out of my own writing. So that's you. That that's good to know. I love being able to uh, do that, and and I've been doing that since my first book. I think that's probably why they tagged me to do this. Um, you know, I I think back to there's a scene that someone just uh, um, I think they uh, sent me a link to. Someone was like, hey, you should read this, and it was someone talking about the mongoose scene from Halo: The Cold Protocol, where um, I oh, think Adriana. Right takes the mongoose and starts beating the crap out of uh, a bunch of, (laughs) uh, you know, uh, young boy. And, uh, you know, that one always comes up whenever I talk to people about the cult protocol, because everyone's like, oh, my gosh, that scene is just ridiculous in terms of like, you know, it's brutal and it's funny at the same time. And I'm like, yeah, I know that's that's the sort of thing that I am actually I call those candy bar scenes where I I, out, I put them in the outline and I just can't wait to write them because I'll, I'll be laughing my, you know, <laughs> butt off as I write them with the knowledge that, like, I will be pulling this reaction out of a reader every time, you know. <laughs> there's a scene in one of my books where I have some in one of my own books where I have someone use a uh, spear fishing gun to shoot someone in the lungs and drag them down a set of stairs because it would be quieter than using oh, a gun. Wow. <laughs> and Damn. every person I talk to who reads that particular book, when they, whenever they circle back around to me, they're always like, dude, that spear fishing scene, the spear gun scene um, is just brutal. And I was just like, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I love it. <laughs> So is Adriana like your go-to? Like she, she can she can kill everyone. I can make it as gory as possible because she's she's kind of the weapons expert of the group. She is. She has this just sort of uh, fierce abandon to her that I love writing, and yeah, I, I, she's my favorite character just hands down. And and the mongoose scene is still in Halo lore. My my favorite moment. I'm glad that that's canon and that exists. And, it, <laughs> and I put it in there because speaking as a gamer, I always found the, 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 the little quad bike to be absolutely useless to play with. Yes. I mean, every time I got on one, everyone's like, oh, no, no, it's great for this reason. I'm like, the only thing that's ever happened to me when I've been on a quad bike is that I've been sniped, shot, knocked off or killed or grenaded or sticky grenaded. Like it just, I've had nothing but grief when I'm on one of those things. I just, the only thing I found it useful for was to give to Adriana to beat someone up with. <laughs> that, that is the actual like true way to use a mongoose. Cause if you're riding it, it's paper mache. It just <laughs> immediately explodes. It just makes you a target. Everyone's like, look, there's a dude on a quad bike. Let's shoot him. So what do you think of the gun goose? Cause now they have one with a gun mounted to the front. It makes you a bigger target. <laughs> <laughs> Can't argue with that. <laughs> so I'm I'm kind of curious about something you were talking earlier about, like working with 343 and doing the book. Did you ever have any time during writing Envoy? I'm thinking of one specific character where you killed them off and 343 had any like apprehension against it. I'm personally thinking of Hecabe, who is up there with now po- probably one of my favorite brutes. And he like comes and goes in the space of a novel. Do you ever have any point when you're writing something where three four three go, 
I like that character, could we keep him? Or do you just like get to go on with what you're doing and like wipe them out? They've been happy to let me wipe things out that I wipe out that I create, you know? So I, you know, I'm, it's, it's kind of cool to, it's kind of cool to, to, they give me that much, that much freedom. I don't know what it's like working for other tie-ins because I've never done that, you know? So I don't know if, if it's the same all around, but they've always been really cool at letting me kill off something that I've created you know, I didn't create Grey Team, so even though I get to make a lot of stuff up, I don't think I've never suggested killing off Grey Team. So, spoiler! Um, but... Uh, <laughs> no, we're giving you all the credit for them. Yeah. So, but the other characters I create that come and go uh, inside of the individual novels, I feel like, you know, they've always just been like, oh, okay, you know, this this person can die. That that works out. So, I, I, liked, I liked creating Hecabe. I thought he was a great, you know, villain. Uh, you know, and he's a he's a sympathetic villain. He's he's not completely, you know, his his reasoning is sound. Um, you understand why he's doing things he does. He has a strong perspective, and uh, he just made a lot of wrong choices. <laughs> uh, yeah, because funny, like we were talking about this in the book club, and when we were going over the novel, it's like that's the thing I get about Hecabe is when he talks about why he's doing this. I was reading the book, going, oh, I kind of want him to win a little bit now. Like he, yeah. he seems like he's not entirely without a good cause here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's got some hurt. Uh, he's got some legitimate grievances and, you know, it's just that his solution to solving them is, is, is pretty horrible. <laughs> and uh, the, the flip side of course is, you know, that old saying, you know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And so he, he sees the solution to his problem is absolute power and, and he gets it. And as a result, he goes to being something that could be possibly contained or stopped to something that must be destroyed. That's awesome. I mean, Envoy seems to be full of that. All of your characters have wonderful backstories and motivations, and they all have linkages to broken pasts. I mean, Hecabe has his loss, and you have the Sanghili with all of their loss, uh, mm-hmm. specifically that band of Sanghili, and then not a specific loss, but Grey Team themselves have lost their unit cohesion because of the decisions that, that they were had to make and then mm-hmm. you have melody has lost and then all the everybody in Cairo is here because of everything that they've lost i mean it's a very somber universe that you've created for all these people together to be in one place trying to like hash that out and find something that to coexist some way of coexisting or destroying everybody depending on who you are yeah i think the book was wonderful for that thank you um on top of that then um it seems you you seem to have pretty fairly loose and leeway with the stories you're writing and what you want to do so you've said that adriana was one of your more your characters that was fun is was there any new character that you really enjoyed writing for or was particularly challenging that you found difficult so um i you know the the heart of this novel for me actually ended up becoming uh, roshka and uh, melody the way they play off of each other and become a foil to each other and the way um, Roshka becomes a melody and in the end really for me was just a really cool character line because a lot of a lot of Sanghili uh, are kind of end up being typecast in the kind of quote unquote the sort of warrior culture that has been presented up till now and so for me it was kind of a sign that you know the splinter Sanghili area is kind of beginning to head off into a different kind of culture of its own making, which also includes the ability to have these strong ambassador types. And and he's kind of learned something about war and when to fight and how to fight. That's really valuable, I think. And I, I just love that character growth that he goes through and melodies uh, kind of working with him to, to, to kind of be a teacher, a mentor almost. Um, I don't know. I felt a lot of warmth towards the two of them. Those two characters had a really interesting connection throughout the entire book. It was, I hate you, you're kind of cool. You know, It's it was a really interesting back and forth to see these characters, you know, kind of work off of each other and change off of each other and learn. Especially since they're two different species that don't particularly like each other at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Melody becomes a little bit more of a badass and Rojka becomes a little bit more of a negotiator. Yeah, it's, it was a wonderful badass. dynamic. <laughs> What's that? 
I said while 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 staying as a badass as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah rogue is he started off very strong i mean the introduction to him was awesome and this um how he rationalized everything it was great to hear his his chain of thought of like his his warring kind of um motivations inside him and ultimately why why he had to, to sacrifice his maid to get where he did and i loved i love the ending i love the ending of this book um how all the kind of characters wrap up and in terms of where they go next is um very exciting Rochka's very like, he's like, okay, I guess I'm gonna die now. No, nah, I'm still alive. All right, let's find another way to die. <laughs> it's just through the entire book, and then he ends up alive at the end, and he's like, huh, I guess I have to find something else to do. <laughs> yeah, he he had a lot of last stands. I think probably the, the you have the record. I think for the number of last stands that he, <laughs> he had. Yeah, yeah. No, he he kept expecting a glorious death and 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 not getting it. <laughs> but I think he came to terms with that at the end, uh, which, which he was does. very good. Um, in a Halo novel, um, you've I as I said I'm not familiar with your works, but you said you're writing other species and other kind of sci-fi, so probably you're probably used to this. Um, so the shifting perspectives in a Halo book, um, a lot of them uh, have this where you're going from human adults, and recently there's been a lot of like children introduced into the universe as well as like you've got different alien races. And um, what was that like to kind of bounce between? It, it, for me, it's fun because you're trying to exercise and come up with a character that has growth and meaning to a reader and to a human, you know, um, while also trying to show something a little bit different, you know, uh, a, a creature with different different values, different perspectives. Uh, for me, that's that's kind of the fun of science fiction is to play those little games, you know. And so the idea of, of this you know, the Sangheili as they're portrayed and as they're supposed to be written, you know, according to the the guidelines of the way things have been done in, in lore, but then trying to create a situation where one would voluntarily be at peace with becoming an ambassador or, or an envoy in, in the future, um, you know, and then uh, trying to show uh, a Jiral Hane chieftain who is uh, sympathetic, but still super villainous and also give the Jiral Hane some more screen time. You know, because that's not that's not a group that's gotten a lot of uh, POVs, uh, per point of views in in the uh, universe in general. So I thought that was really interesting to kind of dig in deep. And I was grateful for the help from three four three because they did a lot of um, suggesting like uh, specifics about uh, the Jiral Hane that they had in mind that I could fit in there with it with uh, you know flashbacks to the way things would be on on uh, I think it's Dosiak. Um, the kind of, uh, uh, yeah, just lots of little details that they would suggest like here, have him, you know, maybe they can think about this or, or maybe there can be a memory of this kind of animal, just stuff like that. That was really cool to pepper in there because it really fleshed out. I think the whole Giral Hane experience. Uh, yeah, you definitely nailed it with, with them as a rate in, in terms of like even making them interesting because they are fairly one note. They are just brutes mm -hmm. and it was very interesting to get a another character um in, in terms of Hecabe of someone that we could read about and in some way um kind of link with and understand their motivations and what they were doing so it was great to see that and and just on, on top of that I know the banished is mentioned in your novel I think it may be one of the first novels that we've seen the banished in which was this um new faction created for Halo Wars and stuff like that so they're at the moment in our own little kind of subgroup of Halo one of the most interesting factions. So it was great to see them mentioned in this book, mm -hmm. even in terms of like how Hecabe views the banished on Atriox. And Atriox was one of the kind of greater kind of examples of a brute. And now we have another one in terms of mm -hmm. Hecabe. And I love that we have brutes that are like not normal brutes. They're different ways of thinking and they're trying to achieve something different because of that. Well, yeah, there's, you're trying to avoid the, uh, the, the problem, you know, like jokingly, it's called the Star Trek problem where you run into a, you know, a planet and, it, and it's, it's all like, you know, it's all water and everyone who comes from that planet has like one kind of culture and one kind of set of views. So the fun part is to try and start showing that, you know, like any, anyone, you know, any, even people within a very similar culture will have lots of different views. And so beginning to show that the brutes, you know, the Jiral Hane are, are a collection of many different things is kind of cool to me, at least to show that there's, you know, there's a, a breadth there, a width of, of thinking. It's too bad he's dead now. It is too <laughs> bad he's dead. R.A.P. <laughs> um, so you 
some of these questions are now kind of obsolete because I think you've answered a lot of stuff and you know, <laughs> talking about it was like to work with three for three and stuff. But um, in terms of like the restrictions on characters and stuff like that, because obviously Halo was a very character driven universe, mm-hmm. and from our perspective, you you were a great team. You created them. They went away because you went away. They came back because you came back. <laughs> um, so we all kind of love that. But everyone else in specifically kind of Envoy, they're all new characters created just for the story. It, it would seem that all the other, say, main characters are like mentioned in passing and stuff like that. And mm. um, was that specifically for a reason? It, yeah, because because the novel was going to be set kind of in between games. I didn't want to. There's a lot of uncertainty there, I guess. In terms yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty there because they were firming up things. So, I mean, even just the very last chapter where, uh, is it Osmond uh, comes in? We, yes. you know, even even making sure that that could work required some, like, you know, making sure, like, you know, right before the book goes to print that this, this is going to work for everyone. Like, you know, that they hadn't, you know, they didn't have Osmond moving around somewhere else in, in game continuity so you know there you know even as it was close to going to print i had resigned myself to the idea that they might change the name to something else and and require me to rewrite you know that last chapter briefly in order to make it fit with in-game continuity but it worked out that we could do it um and so that's why i i focused more on my own characters and and kind of uh you know did only let things come through in passing and in name because uh, there was a lot of uh, work going on 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 subsequent uh, games, so I, I did not want to cause any trouble in that direction. Whereas in the Cole Protocol, I, I you know since I was doing it as a prequel, I got to play with keys and um, you know uh, basically kind of set up his backstory and and everything was frozen, so I didn't have to worry about continuity as much. You got to play with a lot of major characters in the Cole Protocol because you got Theo Vadam, you got the Arbiter, and yep. you have two prophets to play with in that book as well. As well as Captain Keys, shall we say? Yeah, that was fun, you know, because uh, you know one of the you know one of the questions that people had always wondered is why he never has a gun on him in in the uh, bridge. Um, and so basically, I kind of dramatized a little bit of why the, why he would be averse to having a gun on the bridge. Um, and uh, you got to kind of dig into just more and more of why he would be the person he is later back then. You know, you kind of showed how he came to be and also sneaking Thel in, in there for the first encounter, I thought was pretty cool because I think it was Thel versus Adriana, wasn't it? Um, it's been 10 yeah. years since I've written the book, but I'm pretty sure it's Thel think- versus... Or was it Jai? Okay. I think it was. Jai was going back for an ODST who was wounded. And yes, yes. Bumped. And that encounter, by the way, was incredible. What a, what a was first so meeting good. of the Arbiter, this big character in the Halo universe now, to meet a Spartan for the first time and just how that was written. And just, it really did sell sell the what the Spartans are and in terms of the world and really helped ground them. And as I said, it was just an awesome encounter. And wasn't that one of the first times the Sanghili used the name Demon for a character as well, for a Spartan? I think that's how I set it up, yeah. Um, oh, wow. And I think they uh, actually dramatized it, too, in one of the uh, video game cutscenes uh, that you pick out of a terminal somewhere, I think, in a in later Halo game. In Halo 2 Anniversary. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Speaking of a great team, um, that mission took, like... Where did that come? That was amazing, and just what that did to the team that you actually you broke this team, and they spent this the period of the book coming back together and coming to terms with that. That was actually a really great suggestion from three four three. I think uh, Jeremy and Tiffany suggested that to me. They uh, I had um, an incident that was similar that was you know to break them, um, and that they would have to question and. And we're trying to heal from and figure out what it was they'd done. Um, and that would enrage the Sangheili. Um, but uh, it was not as big as that. And so when Jeremy and Tiffany came back to me, they were like, hey, can we, can we, we'd like, you know, we've, the team has thought about this and they came up with this suggestion and they, they would like you to, to, to do this and to make this bigger. Um, and when I started writing the book, I, I not, you know, I'd not pitched it as bigger because that, that, that's a, I don't know, it sets a, 
it, it it's it's big. I mean, I think that that sets a precedent for other things in the game. You know, in terms of like you know they went behind the scenes and blew blew up an entire planet of Sangheili. Um, that's huge, and so uh when they when they suggested that that would be something they would like for me to do i was absolutely on board with that i was like that would be that would that would make them the demon three for sure um that makes you know rojka's uh it just incessant and obsessed you know pursuit of them across the desert make that much more sense the implications i imagine in the greater halo universe is huge for that i mean I was talking to the guys when we were doing our book club. I can't remember another moment of this Nova bomb, this weapon being used. And definitely not to... The idea of humanity being able to do that is not something I ever really considered. And it just... it just it, It's such a huge deal. It's just so huge that you gave humanity this, this ability and that they obviously very sparingly used it. But that in doing so, broke this team of Spartans that are like... You'd imagine the tightest knit of people in, yeah. in the universe are, are the Spartan 2s. What a huge event, man. It was wonderful to read. It was and just... a, a total Hiroshima type level event. So I just like wanted people to discuss, you know, I wanted it to be a morally complicated event because it's one, you know, war is, war is complicated and we have all these different reactions. We have a full spectrum of human experience. And so, you know, I wanted them to, you know, the team's kind of split on whether or not they should have done it. You know, um, they, the, the Sangheili are split you know, absolutely devastated by it. But on the other hand, you know, the Sangheili don't really have a finger to point with because they've been glassing yeah. planets under orders, you know? Um, so the moral, you know, that the, no one really has any moral high ground on this uh, event. And so as they themselves discuss throughout the book, you know, there's this point at which you have to decide if you keep, you keep spiraling through it or you figure out how to move past it, you know? And so, I was I was reading some interviews and looking at some stuff about, you know, people who've been involved in building, you know, the nuclear weapons that were used in World War II and the people who survived the blasts and and how reconciliation happens and things like that. And that was kind of the metaphor that was in my mind as I was as I was writing this, which was how to bring some of that into the book, which is the book is about not so much war, but about what 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 is left after left? war you know and how how that affects people you know melody is a uh you know war refugee um many of the people on caro war refugees they're trying to rebuild um and war is coming again which is something that happens in real life and so they have a lot of complex reactions to it and i just wanted to try and capture some of those that now to me even makes it stick out in terms of they were powering their city with with a decommissioned nuke, and I love mm-hmm. that idea that they were using this weapon to rebuild, specifically to power the rebuilding. Yeah, and the literal plowshare into yeah. you know from a from a sword type thing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. Um, I never really considered that it, that's the kind of the, the the depth of the background you went into to get that kind of um that reaction, I guess, from us, and I think it worked. Um, really, and not only what happened, but the when. I think was very important so that was kind of fascinating like an extra element to it of they destroyed this planet after peace had been achieved but they didn't know it and then that's kind of the huge another kind of huge moment that that for me is one of those really fascinating things where you read you know when war gets declared over it's hard to send the message out to all your resources out on the field so you know when i read about when i read military history you always read these examples of of battles that continue after peace has been declared you know there are always these sort of like convulsions that happen after the fact aftershocks and so for this to be that i thought was really interesting like you know a hiroshima level event that happens because peace was declared but you know radio radio signals were not sent to the people on their way out that's crazy (laughs) crazy thing but so on that, I know it's a very deep subject. We're going to very <laughs> sharply go into something uh, more lighter. Uh, in Envoy, you have this new race, these new beings, this new super weapon. Um, surprise from Halo. It's buried underground and the Forerunners build it. So you've, you've that classic Halo trope <laughs> of there being something underground that the Forerunners <laughs> left behind. I, I think one of the characters even says, you know, a bunch of aliens doing archaeology. That never ends well. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. They're <laughs> digging. Okay, that's going to be bad. Um <laughs> So you have this the Sharkui, um, 
and I think we had discussed this, and the guy didn't inform me. I had never, I imagined this was your creation. I was going to ask where it came from, but apparently this is something very, very, very old that just never yeah. made it into the original game. Yeah. So can you talk about that? Um, yeah, so the Sharkoi come come all the way back from the, I think, the very first game, the uh, back when it was still kind of being evolved out of the original, uh, you know, post-marathon era. It was going to be something that looked like, I think they call it a, a Drenol. Anyway, there I, or it was called a Drenol. I forget the details of it. But basically, there was going to be another class of, of creature, um, of alien, that you attacked. And they had some mock-ups. That, you know, it had like one eye. It was very big, um, very much built like a hunter. Um, with uh, the, the, the uh, how do you pronounce them? Legolo? Um, oh, yeah. Legolo. Legolo. Yeah. And uh, the Sharkoi kind of uh, looked like they would function in the same way, like a big, heavy bruiser of a tank that would take a long time to take down. I imagine from a video gaming perspective, they got dropped in favor of the hunters. But the sketches were out there on the Internet. And so one of the things that they did during I Love Bees was they had a passing reference to um, the... uh, you know, the, the, the whole, uh, you know, as, as they were getting close and invading earth and getting around earth that they, they were close enough that they could unleash the shark koi. And that was an intercepted transmission that was in the, I love bees campaign that you could discover. So they did make a second reference to the shark koi in that they were a thing that could be unleashed once there was a, a small enough area for them to be unleashed. And that it was something that the prophets maybe could, con- could, could control or had in reserve. Um, and that's all that was in Halo lore about them. So it's just kind of a big question mark that fans who were that deep in the lore had had for years, ever since the, the I Love Bees campaign. And when we were thinking about a new big bad, um, some some new weapon, you know, we were we were tossing a lot of ideas back and forth. And three four three said, you know, is there anything you could do with the Sharkoi? And I was immediately like, oh my gosh, the Sharkoi! You're going to let me do whatever I want with the Sharkoi? <laughs> Heck yeah. I will come up with an entire like thing that the Sharkoi are and, and uh, play with it. Um, so, so yeah. You designed the control mechanism around that? I designed that the just... coin. Yeah, the control mechanism, um, the nature in which they are kind of like this distributed intelligence that's been created by the forerunners to work as sort of like a personal bodyguard. Uh, but that they're underneath maybe some kind of semi-intelligent or intelligent race themselves. It's just that they've had these, you know, things sunk into them that that basically take over their consciousness. Um, and that there's something out there in that consciousness, that group mind that they're a part of, um, is also in there too. So, yeah, all of that stuff is stuff that I came up with because I was like, I love this kind of thing and uh, built it out and put it together and put it there underneath the desert and have that as a weapon that uh, the the Gerald Hane are searching for. Um, and this planet and, needs another problem. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I just wanted to make them a super credible threat and something that like a lot of people would be fighting over to get at on this planet. So, yeah, being able to, like, flesh out what the Sharkoi are and introduce them into, into you know, the lore. That, I mean, that's that's hard to pass up. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> and, yeah, I think it came across that way. They were just, and it must have been front to right because immediately the, the book changes the moment that Hecate gets control of them. It becomes a whole scramble. And at this stage, it's all the new alliances get formed because of that. And I love all that, just how it drives the dynamic of all the different groups. It changes everything. Gears. Yeah, it changes everything. One of the just the so many brutal encounters as a result of that. I mean, Rajka has some awesome moments of him facing them down with his sword, and oh, he it just <laughs> cutting builds off their into, limbs. Yeah, he just it just builds his his uh, epic story, his lore up more and more. And as I said, the um the Spartans do quite cool, uh, quite well against them too. So I mean, it's it was cool. Well, it was it was. You know, I love I love playing with sort of the zombie zombified stuff and the idea of like, you know, mind controlled zombies that are like massive hunters running around. I was just, you know, it, there's so many opportunities for just, you know, making some very crazy action scenes. Oh, yeah. When they 
they start killing themselves, jumping off the higher tiers to try and kill the Spartans lower down. Oh, and that was so cool. Like, <laughs> like, God damn it. <laughs> it's crazy. And even just when they're assaulting the the crash uh, covenant ship and they want to take it over and it's just these ships disgorging these monsters into the air and they some of them die some of them don't this is whatever <laughs> it was just a, it was a cool moment of how to invade a ship uh, it was just really cool how we kind of got to experience you know putting on the helmet and actually being able to see through all of these different beings eyes at the same time and you know hikabe going between all of these different beings and talking to people and all this crazy stuff he did and then eventually when he was losing control of them and these beings kind of waking up from being mind controlled, it was really, really interesting. It was, it was challenging to write, but I, I love the payoff. It, it came across really, really well, really, really well. It was easy to understand such a foreign concept of being in the minds of, you know, thousands of different creatures all at once. Coming off some of the more specific kind of topics, um, you were, I read in this book, you went to a, like a hotel state to kind of finish it off. Is I that, did. Like, typical did practice I, did, or what did happened Did I say there? that in the acknowledgements? Oh my gosh. Yeah, you acknowledged that like, <laughs> thanks to everybody who put up with me and for the, I had to go away. I had to lock myself away. I got the impression um, to finish it off. Yes. Oh yeah, my poor wife. Um, yeah, she, she sent me away twice with friends. Um, oh, she or actually, <laughs> she said, so, so yeah, like, uh, this, you know, this book was the third of, of three books that I had to write with some very tight deadlines. And I normally try not to maneuver myself into situations like that, but sometimes it happens. And in order to, to sort of make sure I hit the deadlines, you know, it's hard to juggle family life and, and routine. I've got, you know, wonderful twin daughters, but you know, as a parent, whenever they're running around in in the background, even if they are not getting into any trouble and I'm writing, it's hard to sort of just focus on the writing. And I get distracted, you know, as I hear thump, 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 ow. Um, <laughs> and, you know, just your daily routine and things that are you're obliged to do. Whereas, you know, going off site to a to a place where all you're all you're there to do is write allows you to just sort of double or triple your productivity. Um, and you can't do that full, you know, you can't do that forever, but it is a great way to kind of boost your way towards the end of a project if, if you're trying to, you know, hit a deadline and, and things are kind of running behind. So the first time my wife sent me off to, to, to be with a, uh, some friends in Arizona because it was winter and, and dreary and, you know, I was struggling and, uh, I was able to spend, I think, 10 days with some friends and get a lot of the book written uh, there with them. But when I came home, I still didn't quite have it done. And so at some point, um, you know, she said, like, why don't you just go to a hotel room and hole up and order room service and just finish this? Because I was, you know, when you're when you're when you're falling behind and you're and you're trying to hit a deadline and it's and it's and it's really set in stone you know, you start freaking out and having anxiety, you know, so instead of eating dinner with your family, you're just sitting there brooding because you're not working on on writing or you know you're sitting there trying to be with your family but instead your your head's just you know a million miles away so she was you know just telling me like look if you're if you're gonna be not here you might as well be not here so <laughs> she was trying um, to prevent a shining event yes yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> all work and no play makes toby a dull boy um <laughs> So yeah, I, I basically uh, you know I had some points on on a credit card for uh, Hilton I think, and I went down to Columbus, Ohio, and I basically just holed up in a Hilton, which actually ended up being kind of horrible because it was under construction. Which oh no, it just it ended up not quite being the the quiet reflective atmosphere I needed, but. I, I spent the points and I was there. So I was like, what else am I going to do? Um, and so I just kind of put on my noise canceling headphones and just sat in this dark, sad room surrounded by people that were just like running power tools from like nine o'clock until like four every day. Um, and just worked on, on, on the, on the book, you know, until, until I had and it done. That's why we have all these construction scenes in the book. <laughs> <laughs> If there's a loud whining sound for the last like quarter of the book that is, you know, never goes away. Now you know why. <laughs> oh, that's where the scene came from where you kill all the engineers in, in the room. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
Um, so Krista, you have two questions here you want to ask. So Krista's been dying to yeah. ask you this one. And I'll, I think it's some kind of award that Chris is trying to give. Yeah, I actually sure. have an award for you. Um, <laughs> you hold the current record for the most chapters in a Halo book. So congratulations. <laughs> well Yay! <done>. <laughs> <laughs> what was it, like 74 chapters or something like that? Oh, well. It was um, a lot. <laughs> that is that is very exciting. I uh, <laughs> uh, would like to thank the Academy the voters and uh definitely the readers the fact the fact checkers yeah the fact checkers um that was for halo envoy right no it was uh cold protocol because uh, or, in cold i'm sorry protocol, cold instead protocol. of using yeah. the little like dot yeah. thing yeah. that you used in this one it was just a different chapter when you switched views i got so many complaints about that that for envoy i did put the little dot thing in Oh, go so. away. That was deliberate. That's gas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I knew it. Yeah. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> I opened Envoy. I'm like, where are all the chapters? There's only like 26 of them. There are only 28. Really um, you know, as I wrote it, as I wrote it in the first draft, it has like 70 chapters. But as I combined it into standard um, Halo Reader expected format, um, it has fewer <laughs> chapters. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's funny that's pretty good so do all, your other books have a similar like setup where it's a lot of different chapters when switching between characters i like to do a different chapter when i switch to a different character to just give the reader a heads up um i tend not to like to switch points of view inside of a chapter i don't know why i mean it's it's all it's i mean even chapters are just conventions in and of themselves like terry pratchett uh, a humorous fantasy writer who i really like doesn't even use chapters you know he just everything's a a you know everything's a hashtag everything's a, a scene a scene break and he just switches to where he needs to switch which is kind of brilliant actually chapters came out of historically just the fact that books were made out of um you know, novels were serialized originally in newspapers. So each section of it ran in the newspaper. And then when they were done, they would gather them all up and put them in a book form. So the idea of chapters is actually kind of like an artificial construct that we just kept. So you can do just about anything you want. You can have 80 chapters, you can have 20 chapters, you can jump in between POVs inside the chapters, you can do a chapter, you know, per point of uh, view, whatever you want, you can as long as it works, you can get away with it. But yeah, definitely a lot of people were like, this isn't what I was expecting. So I did kind of make a note of that. Um, <laughs> Toned went it back, down just a little bit. I'm went back that was to such a big deal. It really was a big deal for people. Not all people, but like there were some right, people that right, had some right. very strong opinions about this. So I, I was like, all right, all right. Uncle. When you go into trivia sections like on Halopedia and stuff about your book, it actually says this has this Halo book has the most chapters of all Halo books. That's but it's not like the longest. Fact. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but it's the biggest book, clearly. <laughs> yeah. It has the most chapters. It has the most chapters. Well, you know, it's nice to win at something. <laughs> I mean you already won with Grey Team. Now you just have two you have two awards now. That's true. Congratulations. Her. Thank you. I'm and very proud. The ending of the book is uh, something specifically uh, on what well, the ending of Call Protocol was amazing. But the ending of Envoy is wonderful in terms of we have all these factions, all these people, and then they each get a measure of satisfaction in their in their endings and whether they get killed off for uh, extreme reasons or whether or not they move on to their next thing so again having osman come in at the end was not something i was expecting and the the, the tease of she set everything up that only initiated the, all of these events is just so machiavellian and just like <laughs> it sends shivers it's just like it's like oh do you know what I mean? It just it's but that's very Osmond. Feels... So I I like how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, it's also like a really great Nick Fury moment, right? <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I imagine her standing there in the shadows, just like you know, with, with her eye patch. <laughs> but um, <laughs> she's great, and how that sets everything up in terms of what all the next characters going to be doing, like what great team are going to be doing next. That sounds exciting. How they have all oh, these. Oh, such a teaser, you know I mean? though. Oh yeah, so <laughs> many <was> teasers. So <laughs> So check back in ten more years, where uh, I will. <laughs> Great team only does it. Great team only has a mission every ten years. It's the rule. That's the rule. 
yeah <laughs> that obviously gets us all excited so a lot we've done a lot of hypothesizing as you can imagine and i bet the fan base would do uh, about what that means what comes next um as you said at the start of the show you've confirmed uh what halo 6 is so that was great and um <laughs> you're just trying to get me in trouble <laughs> no no yep. absolutely not we're actually sending uh, this straight to 343 actually yeah <laughs> right after yeah. With, a of, with a list of demands send it straight um, to frankie straight to frankie <laughs> <laughs> so we're not obviously going to ask you anything that you can't say after that but obviously all of these things um i imagine is it's, there's more coming for these characters even if it's from yourself I, I, do you have any plans further along the lines that you can talk about um i i don't have any plans that i can't talk about um you know i i you know i had a lot of fun doing this but uh right now we don't have any plans um i'm working on some of my own original stuff um i had a lot of fun working with tiffany and uh working with jeremy they were they were great um but uh you know it's it's kind of a it's kind of uh, that's as far as we've taken it, you know, personally, and I'm not stopped. F- I don't think I'm stopped from saying this. If so, um, whoops, but, uh, <laughs> you know, my, my thought was just in trouble now. To buy yeah, it. exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, my thought would just be that I, you know, when I was finishing up the book, I thought, you know, this, this sort of team of this sort of team of, you know, uh, uh one sang Healy and Melody and the gray team you know sort of gray team getting some depth some depth to it so that they're not just a strike team that's sent to do crazy stuff but the idea that they they have basically a diplomatic core attached to them now was really interesting to me and the idea that they might be um, used in a place to run around the universe and troubleshoot um, some really complex things that are popping up in the universe right now um really appealed to me. So that's kind of how I was setting it up. I mean, really Admiral Osmond recruiting them kind of is basically my Nick Fury moment. I, I very consciously set it up like that. You know, the idea that this is going to be a team, a multi-species team that, you know, basically is, is uh, the start of the, uh, something kind of new and interesting running around and fixing things was kind of what I hinted at, at the end of this. And, and whether or not I'll be invited back to, to ever write that, uh, I don't know, but that was kind of what I tried to set up, you know, in case I ever got the chance to come back. That was what I'd like to do. Just like at the end of uh, Halo of the Cold Protocol, I tried to set it up so that Grey Team is off doing something in the background so that, you know, I could one day come back and, and do something current with them instead of just a prequel, you know, because they were stuck in the past of Halo lore when I got my hands on them. So being able to shoot them into the future worked because I was able to reuse them again here 10 years later. And my hope is that I'd be able to, you know, someday maybe do another uh, little piece on them. But if not, I had a lot of fun doing it. I was honored to get to play in the sandbox, you know, as someone who enjoys playing Halo, it was a lot of fun to get invited to do something, you know, by a franchise that you really love, you know, so, Hey guys from left for dead, you know, if you uh, are ever doing a novel <laughs> holler, you're breaking our one rule <laughs> um, <laughs> you're gonna write a kill zone book and we can't have that no 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 I, i've got kids i don't have that much time to play that many video games <laughs> so on that i'm really happy that it is open-ended and we all really hope you do come back and that there is more from them even not great team but you've created wonderful characters that have interesting stories leading off this book so if they pop up again, um, we'll all be very excited and very happy about it. So oh, thank, thank you very, you very much, much for that. Um, what we're going to do now is take some community ca- questions that we had. If you hope you don't mind, we, we advertised that we were yeah, doing do uh, this show. Um, so Chris is going to take you through this. They can be as fast as you want. You don't need to go crazy in depth because some of them have already kind of been answered. So um, sure. after that, we'll, we'll uh, you can pimp some of your stuff and we'll let you go. So, all right. Thanks very much. Over to you, Chris Brown. All right. Some of these are really funny and silly, so uh, <laughs> be prepared. Uh, Timothy Welsh asks, uh, when are they going to let you make a Grey Team stealth action game? Uh, we can oh. this and start the show with Halo 6. <laughs> oh, <of course. laughs> Halo what? Yeah, you know, um, I don't have any control over what they do with video games. So, you know, if, <laughs> if, 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 if the people who work on that side of things are ever inspired and use something from one of my books, I, you know, like they did with the, the, the reissue of Halo 2, then I'm just always utterly pleased that they're paying attention. And, and if not, that's okay too. It's just fun to play. 
Next one is from Alex. Uh, how, who came with the idea of using the Charcoy? How was that process? How was the process of expanding the alien species that had so little background? You know, like I said previously, yeah, you know, they, they approached me and said, hey, can you, you know, do you know, do you, do you know what the Charcoy are? Can you do anything with them? And I was just like, boy, howdy, I'd love to. <laughs> so I basically immediately then came up with a ton of stuff to flesh it out. So, you know, if they ever use it in a game, I'll be completely thrilled that I got to write some of the, you know, some of the backstory if, if they ever do use it. Um, all of that, all the, uh, most of the details about the Sharkoi, um, basically the thrust of that was me and then Jeremy and Tiffany and I kind of went back and forth. They wanted to make sure it was more technological, more, you know, based in the, in the halo, you know, existing technologies and lore. So they, they came up with, uh, some tweaks and stuff that made it, you know, much more halo-y, but yeah, the, the basic thrust of it stayed the way I envisioned it, which was that, you know using some kind of controlling unit in order to uh, have these thousands of things under your thumb um, and that they were originally used by the forerunners as kind of like bodyguards against the flood. Um, I thought was kind of, kind of cool. Uh, speaking of the Sharkoi, uh, Silver at Halo Completionist was asking about if we'd ever see them in a Halo game or, I mean, would you personally like to fight a Sharkoi in a Halo game? I think it'd be <laughs> so dope to fight a Sharkoi in a Halo game. You know, uh, can you imagine, you know, having them jump down out of the ceilings or jump down from the top of buildings and like splatter on the ground and then just, yeah, yeah. I mean, they would just be an utter, it'd be an utter mess to try and fight in a landscape full of them, wouldn't it? Uh, It could be interesting. I'd love to see it. It'd almost be like a Shadow of the Colossus kind of battle because these things are massive, like 16 feet tall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be like that, but lots of them. I mean, you'd ha- it'd be like the uh, <laughs> ultimate boss battle type situation, right? That's too exciting. Um, Nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Colin Perkins asks, what does the Halo Bible smell like? <laughs> <laughs> I- I'm sorry, he's a little weird. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, the, the first one, the first one was printed out on uh, regular paper. So it smelled like, uh, you know, if you print anything out from your paper, just go hug that and fondle that and smell that. <laughs> and you've got a pretty good uh, approximation. Um, now it's all kind of uh, in-house and digital. You just kind of get like a crypto key and and you can access some of the resources that way. So and then basically, but basically my. My Halo Bible uh, w- was uh, Tiffany O'Brien and Jeremy Patnewd, and uh, I did not scratch and sniff them. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's way more. And I'm sure they're much happier about that, that than. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best response we've had so One far. second, I got a community question. Just, just, just pretend this didn't happen. At Dreamwinder asks, uh, in science fiction, a location can be a character in itself. In Envoy, what led you to make Kara? Caro Rakoi, the desert planet that it is, and how do you consider environment when you write? Yeah, uh, environment is really important. And actually, Caro Rakoi is not a desert planet. Um, They're basically just in the desert region of it. Um, They made some maps in the beginning of the book. And if you look at it, you can see that there there are mountains and some different, you know, different, it it suggests different environs than just, you know, desert across an entire, so this isn't Tatooine, you know. Um, I just basically (laughs) had them placed there uh, because... uh, that is where uh, the resources were that they f- they felt and the city had been built in the past. And I didn't really flesh out a ton of what happened beyond, you know, beyond the desert and what might be uninhabitable and why the planet might be uninhabitable outside of the desert and why they're kind of forced to it. But you can see that the uh, the um, r- the 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 sorry, the uh, the Sangheili basically are basically starting to camp out where it's nicer. Um, you know, they've, they found some of the rivers and they've been basically setting it up so that it's nice and lush. And there's a sense that, you know, there's other things going on in this planet, or at least I tried to give that, I, I may not have failed, but I, I, I didn't want it to be all a desert planet. I should have hammered that a little harder, you know, now that I've seen some of people's reactions, but I definitely wanted that area to have though, a very strong desert like feel, because that was what I wanted to use, um, for the backdrop. And I particularly wanted them to have to cross that long desert. So um, that was important to me. Um, so yeah. And, and, and the planet itself is its own, it's, it's got a personality and I like that, uh, you know, the areas that they were at had, had their own personalities, if that makes any sense. So going on that, um, 
This is probably one of the first Halo games that actually has a map at the beginning of the book. Was that your right. idea to include that? No, was that was 343. Three? Three. It was totally dope. I love maps, right? You know, because I'm a science fiction nerd and fantasy reader. It's, it's nice so, to see where everything is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, of course, as an author, I'm always kind of like, crap, how carefully did I map everything out myself when I wrote it? Oh, yeah. Um, because now they're actually trying to reproduce it visually. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Um, <laughs> danger, Will Robinson. So, uh, yeah, but actually, uh, we, 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 uh, kind of, I, you know, I had like some very crude sketches that I had done. So I kind of had, you know, I think I took a, a snapshot of those and, and they kind of put everything together by the notes and the outline and, and sent it off and they did this awesome map. So I was totally chuffed about that. I mean, I got, I got a book with uh, a map in it and that's always a win for me. It was really surprising when I first opened the novel. I'm like, oh, there's a map in this one. That's awesome. Now you can follow along. <laughs> yeah, we all love seeing where our characters are at in relation to each other. So um, Michael Rosales asks, can we have some extra info on the mind or minds that existed inside the Forerunner helmet? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no you can't. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> nope. <laughs> hey, let, me, let me try to ask this. Can, we kind of pieced it together from, from the book and that... A, a part of that mind gets trapped kind of in that in that helmet and so like, we have that night that moment where the governor is you know trying her best to recall everybody back but she's like fighting fighting the helmet it, it, mm -hmm. these are just old you know past uh wielders i suppose and all of their minds are just kind of in a res re remnants of of everything together just kind of influencing on on whether you know to try to still have their ideals kind of put in there is kind of where that was going from yeah i mean the idea of this thing is like basically mapping your neurons and pulling them into it in order to figure out what is happening and in order to be able to understand how to translate your thoughts into action then you know there's something there's something underneath right there has to be some kind of program there has to be some kind of of you know uh translation software running so you know, uh, 343 actually uh, worked a little bit. We came up with uh, with me on that. And we came up with the idea of calling it the Vertex. Um, as for what it is and, and where else it might show up, um, I have no further information on that. So that's just something that we, we came up with for this book in particular. And whether or not it'll get used again is is uh, a complete question. You know, that's up to them. But it, it was unique for this book. Um, I don't know of any other plans to use it elsewhere outside of Sharkoi. But yeah, there's definitely this idea that there are ghost images. There's ghost knowledge in particular of the past. I don't think the Vertex has its own its own goals, but you're just kind of dealing with the leftover mental residue of everything that came before you. Though towards the end of the book, it does have some, you know, self-preservation mechanism in it. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And it definitely has the most recent, you know, will, which is um, Hikabi's, uh, you know, the, the you know, the Jirhul and a chieftain was the last thing in it. And so when Ellis, you know, when Governor Ellis takes over, she's she's fighting kind of the memory, the 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 goals and you know, um, Hecabe's strong self-preservation instinct are all definitely buried in there because that's the last thing the machine would have would have picked up and imprinted on. So in a way, she's still kind of having a battle with him. And that was a wonderfully crucial moment of her pulling the helmet out of his brain and putting it onto her own. <laughs> that was a big dun so... dun dun moment too. I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> As well, even with, um, like I had that great moment uh, when... Oh, what's her name? I'm forgetting this person. Adriana. Name. Adriana snipes um, Hecabe, and, and we kind of get this great, like, like what is happening to me moment. Like my my eye feels <laughs> like it's gone, but then like what? And then the the, the vertex starts kind of repairing his head, and that, that was another moment. Just like your writing style is just so so great a visual, and just kind of have him feel this weird sort of transformation, but then he also just instantly is gratified by it because he, he starts feeling more connected and more powerful and all that. And, and then to kind of contrast that when, when he gets the helmet ripped off, it's just equally satisfying. And, uh, so yeah, it, it's, it, the vertex I think is definitely something that'd be very interesting to see 
in a in a game or another type of visual medium to kind of see its its kind of inner workings. Because I think David, you mentioned this that a a lot of Forerunner tech that we're familiar with presently doesn't kind of have that symbiotic type of quality to it. Oh uh, yeah, what what I was kind of getting at is that I think you touched upon the point by us that it's um they're like an anti-flood kind of measure that they were kind mm-hmm. of created that way so i got the impression from like i know you might be able to talk about this but it's funny that um this particular piece of forerunner tech is very unlike most other pieces of forerunner tech where it's a very brutal very invasive measure mm-hmm. and i got the sense of the forerunner only agreed to it be out of desperation that it was oh yeah this is a last stand kind of device you know that they're making at the closing moments you know i imagine maybe it's made by you know, a forerunner who's cut off from the rest of the forerunners and 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 surrounded by flood, and and inspired by the idea of the flood, and just trying to create something that you know could, you know, could allow them to fight back. You know, and he's trapped on a on a. This is all me just wild, oh, yeah, baseless yeah. Right, speculation right, right. here, but this is you know you imagine that maybe it's a, it's a forerunner trapped on a on a world where. You know, there's a, a, a semi-intelligent or intelligent species around it, and it builds the vertex and uses them to fight the flood. And it's brutal, and it's desperate, and it's sort of like a tough choice type thing because it's like, you know, we're all going to die anyway. So if I can create this synchronized thing, maybe I can spread my consciousness out and use my knowledge, my more advanced knowledge, to build something with these guys or to fight in a way with these guys that, you know, they wouldn't normally be able to fight and then suddenly you have, you know, the vertex, and it and it and it survives, and it's it's used by you know last few desperate stands, um, but it's not something they they normally would have ever done. It's not as graceful or or uh, you know um, AI oriented as most forerunner stuff is. It's just a or something it's, maybe they're proud a, of, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, it's a crude, desperate hack by a you know last minute group. <laughs> It's also just such a front to forerunner ideologies of pres- preserving life instead of just enslaving yeah. it in this way. It's like a front to their mantle of responsibility kind of thing. Completely, completely an affront. Yeah, and and it is very much like you you know you imagine that the guy who or or, or girl who invented this entirely is like thinking this is the only way they'll biologically even survive the Sharkoi. You know, like if I don't do this, the shark koi have no chance. So this is how I justify it. But it's like repulsive. Especially when you see them kind of struggle to get consciousness and to kind of figure out what happened after the helmet's been taken on and off. It's, it's, it's yeah, really it's a complete violation. Yeah, it's a complete. It's 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 not it's not right. It's unnatural. <laughs> yeah. Out of the forerunner pit because that is yeah. quite the dark pit in halo lore <laughs> but um uh at 343 i community asks uh if you were to cast a great team in a movie who would you choose to play them oh i'm the worst i know this is a hard questions. one yeah <laughs> uh, have you ever visualized them yourself in terms of oh he looks like him or she might be like this um you That's know an easier way to think of it maybe yeah you know um i I I can't that that one I'm gonna have to punt because I, I I I don't I couldn't I couldn't give you actors and actresses to be honest I thought about you know I've, I you, there's always this thing of fantasy casting your 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 novel your you know your your books and I've just never been good at that you know I I do it sometimes but it takes like hours of research for me <laughs> <laughs> you have to actually look up actors names and figure it out. No, I'm I like, you know, that there's an it. actual, there's an actual like person who gets paid, you know, a salary called a casting director whose job it is to do this. <laughs> like it's a whole job, you know, it feels like a lot of work to me <laughs> to do it right. You know. All right. At Miles Dill asks, who is your favorite author personally? Well, uh, I have a lot of favorite authors because just picking one feels like, you know, hey, you who's your favorite kid? Um, it's just so hard to answer. Um, I've been, you know, I, what I like to do is I, li- I like to talk about books that I've recently uh, really enjoyed. Um, some books I've recently enjoyed. Uh, I really enjoyed An Unkindness of Ghosts by River Solomon. I really highly recommend that as a, a really interesting science fiction novel. Um, I really liked uh, back in the day, A Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge. I like a lot of Ian Banks novels. 
um, which uh, I guess are going to be turned into a TV series by Amazon here soon. Um, consider Phlebas is being turned into a, a oh, I heard that. TV series. Um, and I love, I love the entire culture series of books. Let's see what else. Um, uh, one of my favorite novels is CJ Sherry's Merchanter's Luck. Uh, it's, it's, it's about a crew, uh, on a, on a spaceship in the future. It's, it, it gets kind of crew dynamics down really well. I like it. Um, and I like all of CJ Sherry and it's spelled S C or uh, not S C it's uh, C J C H E R R Y H. Um, I like her, uh, science fiction, uh, novels quite a bit. Um, let's see, uh, what else has come out recently that I really enjoyed. I'm, I'm looking over to my, uh, recent bookshelf. There was a book called Six Wakes by Merle Lafferty, which is up for a number of awards recently. That's just a tremendous amount of fun. Um, and what else, what else could I recommend here? Cause my mind is blanking. That's a good start. You know, if you were to read any that's of good, those, that's, that's, range, that's, yeah. that's really good. Um, and then, um, uh, another book I really recommend is Redemption and in Indigo by Karen Lord, which I really enjoyed when it came out a few years back. That's uh, she's a Barbadian writer. I grew up in Grenada, which is one island over. So uh, that 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 was a lot of fun to read. And I, you know, I just read um, the long uh, the long way to a small angry planet by Becky Chambers, which was really fun, a tremendously fun book to read. So yeah. So you tend to read a lot of books in the same genre as your own. I do, but it comes and goes in phases. Right now I'm reading a lot of science fiction and fantasy, but uh, that started up just a year ago. So basically I do like these two to three year sequences where I'll read a ton of genre work and then I will just burn out and then I'll go read some other genre. So uh, I just finished reading a bunch of... uh, uh, mystery novels um, a couple years ago. Uh, I was reading a ton of young adult and then I burned out on that and stopped reading it. Um, before that, I was reading some thrillers, uh, quite a few thrillers. And um, yeah, so basically whenever I just burn out on a genre, I just go grab another genre and start reading that. All right. So our final question, and I know you've probably been heckled a lot about this <laughs> because it definitely sparked some conversation in the Twitter threads, but um, at Toa Freak asks, what co- what mark of Mjolnir gray, uh, armor is Grey Team wearing in Envoy? Yeah, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the on on the cover of Envoy, um, I have no idea because I was not the artist that drew it, nor was I the commissioning uh, person. Um, I think it is a beautiful and gorgeous cover. Um, it's. Uh, you know, just uh, I, I love that kind of almost cell uh, feel it has going going for it. Um, the artist uh, uh, just, uh, you know, he even put some of those ships down there that are featured in the novel on it. He snuck them in there. They're kind of in shadows. Um, but I, I don't know what mark of armor that could that that is. <laughs> um, it could be anything because Grey Team likes to pick up anything that they see that's shiny. So whatever the newest and best is for this period, they have it probably because they're kind of like, uh, you know, birds that see something shiny and go get it. Um, they're very resourceful. Alternatively, they could be uh, mixing everything up based on uh, whatever they have and they've put together. Um, I have in my notes somewhere what mark I think this is, but I don't have my notes in front of me because they're in storage. So I can't answer what I thought it was when I was writing this book. Um, but I knew it was newer than what it was when, when what they had in um, what they had in the uh, first book Cold, um, because Cold they had protocol. time to yeah, they had time to equip between Cole Protocol and this book. Um, you remember that they gave a laundry list of things that they wanted, including a ship. <laughs> Um, yeah. and everyone was Adriana's like really long list <laughs> yeah we're gonna give them that and they're like well they're gonna get it one way or another so we might as well f- officially give it to them um so whatever armor is current um at uh, at the end of of cold protocol um would be feasible but um we don't know when they took off behind the lines um to go to go run their mission and what they would have picked up on a resupply between then and there so um yeah, I, I mean, um, I did give this some thought when I wrote this book, and I, I do have an answer somewhere in my notes, and I 
for the life of me, I wrote this book in what, two years ago. So uh, in the two years since I've moved on and done a lot of other stuff. And so, like I said at the very beginning, my memory is a sieve. Toa Freak, I'm not trying to consciously avoid this. I just honestly <laughs> uh, don't remember anymore um, because I don't remember. So sorry. <laughs> that is That is completely fine. Yeah. And aside to their big laundry list, I absolutely loved that scene where um, they were going after Thars and they were dropping all their weapons and Adriana just kept pulling out weapons. <laughs> like a huge pile. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that classic scene of a badass character being asked to de-weapon and weapons coming out from everywhere. It's just I a, love that trope. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love yeah. it. It was so And hilarious. that's so her. Uh, the the fun part in Envoy was when I was describing also the when they when they meet up and become a team when they're in uh, boot camp basically when they're in training you know uh, all the different exploits that they they uh, you know set out on as as kids after they get turned into Spartans just cracked me up you know they yeah. were they were quite the mischievous band of Spartans though like stealing pelicans and constantly mm-hmm. trying to get out I just loved that about them. Yeah, they were yeah. very fun to read. Uh, as, as I imagine, there's more stories in there somewhere of their childhood or childhood yep. or lack thereof. But um, yep. of that process, like they're they're wonderful. I mean, each escapade just really speaks to who that character is. Well, the thing with Grey Team is that they are not your normal Spartans. They are kind of like the dirty dozen of the Spartans, the the Spartan leftovers that kind of do their own thing. You know, they're the only Spartans that have you know, kind of derobed and showed up somewhere to try to do undercover, which doesn't work because everyone can spot them. Um, <laughs> that was a great scene too. You know, they like, kind of just in these fatigues in a bar, like yeah, totally yeah. Out, of, out of place. Like, okay. Um, I just like having fun with them on that regard and that they just break a lot of the kind of rules and the very seriousness of the entire, you know, the, the, the whole Spartan thing. They just don't see themselves as kind of part of that culture. They're, they're willing to fight. They're, they're in the war. They're there to protect humanity, but they're really going to do it their own way. Dagnabbit, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and they do, they have great personality as a team and as individuals. So I think that that comes across very well. And uh, personally, I do love Jai when you're telling a story from his perspective and he's issuing orders and he's reading the body language and the response he's getting to his orders and then adjusting accordingly to be like, okay, they're not committed to this decision. They don't like this because of X, Y, Z. I need to do something else to address this. I think that was wonderful as a commander of this obscure team, how he go through that and try and do command and keep them together. Um, his, his focus on that was great to read. Especially since, you know, Spartan 2s are kind of very awkward and don't quite get social norms. It's interesting for a Spartan to be so conscious of body language and, you know, what his team is, what his other team members are really feeling and is so in tune with that while other Spartans don't quite get it all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, he he definitely is not, they're, they're not normal Spartans in that regard and and, uh, you know, he's unique in that. And that's why he's the leader, which is that he's the one who pays attention to these things. And he tries to, you know, he acts as a, you know, because Adriana is just sort of going to brute force her way through anything, you know, and Mike is going to, you know, uh, basically try to hack his way through anything. So it's, it's basically, it's basically Jai's you know, Jai's job is to kind of make a team out of them. And so basically that's what he studies and thinks about and focuses on and brings all of his kind of, you know, intellectual, you know, all of his brain power on is just trying to figure these other two people out so that he can make a, a group out of them instead of just, you know, a random assortment of, of chaos. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely what would be a great team would be without Jai. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be a little bit of a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine a lot less effective, but um, I think they're, yeah. they're wonderful because of that. So um, unless anyone has uh, anything they'd like to ask Tobias right now, uh, I guess we'll get into kind of wrapping up. Oren, Krista? I'm good. Just thanks for an awesome you know, pair of books and, and a short story. I mean... Uh, two short stories. Uh, two short stories. Yeah, I, I'll have to... <laughs> I, I'm going to read Dirt this weekend now. Um, It'll change your life. <laughs> and then think about the more more Matt Farback again but, um, for ruining everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. Um, thank you very much. Um, Tobias, this has been awesome. Um, these kind of shows are just total treats to us. I mean, it's wonderful to get like 
that we have this ability the, that we can we're very lucky in terms of like um we get responses to, from, from you guys you you actually respond and come on to our show and stuff like that well um, yeah so this I mean, kind of stuff is incredible I'm, I'm writing it but uh i'm 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 a fan as well so it's it's really it's really cool and it's uh neat 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 to be on here um yeah so um we're going to do some little self pimping and then we're going to let you pimp all your stuff because i know you're you're quite a busy man these days and, and you you got some stuff going on um, so everybody, please come visit our website, tailopocketsofwild.com. Um, we have a whole bunch of different episodes and all sorts of different topics, as you know, um, all under our community tab for all our kind of release schedules and such. And um, We've got a Discord now, and there's Facebook, there's Xbox Live, there's everything there. Um, we're Twitters, we're everywhere that we can be. Um, Tobias, you have a lot of stuff happening, including a Patreon. Do you want to talk about that for us quick? Yeah, sure. Well, my main website is www.tobiasbuckel.com and there you can find, you know, links to all the stuff that I do. And I have a Patreon at uh, patreon.com forward slash Tobias Buckel. So what I do is I write a short story every month for people who jump on board with that. And, you know, the short stories, um, well, one of them was just reprinted in a year's best anthology and a couple of them are going to be in light speed magazine and another one's going to be in apex magazine. So people seem to really dig a lot of the stories. They range from action adventure, kind of like dirt or oasis to, uh, kind of just me noodling around and thinking about, you know, science fiction, most of it's science fiction. If this goes on, you know, what, what will this entail? Um, but on the short story side, I've always done my best to be entertaining and fast paced. So that's what I have a reputation for. And uh, about 120 people have signed up to have a story in their inbox every month for a dollar, as little as a dollar. Um, and, uh, that's been, that's been super cool. And that's super unique. I imagine trying to do things like that or working like that. I, I, this is the first I've ever heard of an author doing something like this. Um, so I'm glad it's working out well for you. It seems uh, a very strange thing to be doing, but it's 2018. <laughs> every every technology, you can do whatever you want now. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, so there are a lot of ways to reach out directly to fans in this day and age, and, and that uh, helps. And, you know, the thing with, um, with being a writer is that you have a lot of irregular income. You know, you sell a novel, you get an advance, and then that's that for like a year and a half. Um, and then once it comes out, you get paid every six months on royalties uh and so you know the the months in between those paydays uh can be long and dark and so yes. <laughs> having ways to smooth your income out like a patreon or you know um occasionally self-publishing really helps kind of make the the you know particularly when you're like a family person makes the makes things go a lot smoother i hope everything's going well for you once again thank you very much for coming on the show it's been awesome i am getting all this information getting halo 6 confirmed getting you know <laughs> all these things to just dying to know was great um, so from all of us um thank you very much yes thank you thank you thank, thank you. you very much and uh with that we'll leave it there uh, evolved evolved evolved